Heavenly Father, again we invite you to be our special guest, because without you, we can do nothing. In Jesus' name, amen. There are so many winds of doctrine, and there's so much turmoil, not only in the world, but also in the church. And how does one deal with it? And there are so many opinions. And uh, some of the prevailing opinions that we have is that you shouldn't preach a straight doctrine because uh, it's not politically correct. It's not politically correct. You must change your ways. And so there have been many experiments with different ways of trying to grow the church. And it seems as if uh, they're not very successful. So let's have a look at some of these issues that are facing us. We have a changing face of evangelism. Every wind of doctrine and worship style is blowing through the portals of even Adventism. And what are the successes that they've actually achieved? You know, we have some mega churches <clears throat> where these things are being practiced. And the main styles would be celebration style churches, emerging church models, even spiritual formation. Started off with Willow Creek type preaching where you have a sort of a theatrical. Uh, component attached to all the preaching styles. And uh, there is a serious problem. Now, if we go to this webpage, adventistonline.com, we find that uh, there have these, been these experiments, and it started off in the United States of America, where they started off with two mega churches, celebration type churches. And then it spread all over the world. Initially, it spread to Australia. And there they formed five mega churches, and they grew very rapidly. But uh, as the statistics show, the growth was all lateral growth. In other words, they would draw people from the other churches, the youth in particular, and fill these churches until they grew to mega churches. And it was celebration-style worship, with uh, much activity and very little message. And what is the result thereof? Well, one after the other of these mega churches actually left the fold and became separated and are today just like any other Sunday keeping church. Some of them have even turned viciously upon their former allegiances. And of the five that were initially created, only two are still within the sisterhood. So what have they actually achieved? They've achieved to draw all the young people into these churches and then take them out. They've actually robbed us of our youth. And that is rather a sad statement to make. Not only is this happening at the level of the church, but we find it in our schools and in our colleges. One after the other is being closed. And we're trying to find methods to resolve the issue. And what do you do? Do you bring in more and more and more worldly aspects in order to bolster it? Or is there another problem that might be somewhere at the core of this. So we have a couple of questions. What keeps our members and our youth in particular in the church? Yes, these churches grew like crazy, but they robbed us of the youth. They didn't add to the youth. They didn't add to the strength of the church. So what keeps our members engaged and on fire for the Lord? Is it the decibels that do it? Is it the worship style that does it? What enabled the disciples and the reformers and our pioneers to stand undaunted in the face of fierce opposition, ridicule, and persecution? 
were the reformers kept in this movement of the Reformation through the worship style? Or what was it that kept them motivated? What kept them motivated to the point that they were willing and ready to go to the stake? Wasn't it truth? It was truth alone. They often met in basements. They often met where they had to speak in whispers. It certainly wasn't some elaborate style of worship or some contemplation or some repetitive preaching or some mantra that had to be uh, well practiced on a regular basis. It was truth and nothing else. John 8 verse 32 says, And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Not your worship style. Whenever there is a technique that is required to keep people occupied, there's a problem. Do you have to practice a certain technique to keep your marriage partner or your girlfriend or something within your realm? Is it a technique? Well, maybe when, <laughs> when you start off, you might use a technique. But, you know, it doesn't work for very long. There has to be something more than a technique. There has to be a relationship. So it's truth that sets you free and nothing else. So I've done this many times, but let's just run through it again. The three aspects of truth is that the Word is the truth. Jesus is the truth, the way and the life. And the law is the truth. And if you don't have those three components blended together, then you don't have truth. You take one out, you have partial truth. Can't preach 60%, 70% truth. It's got to be 100%. And then there's an aspect which we often seem to ignore or forget, and that is the aspect of present truth. As we find it in 2 Peter 1 verse 12, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in present truth. And present truth has to be preached. You have to be established in present truth, which does not negate former truth. You're established and you know the plan of salvation, but there is a present truth that needs to be preached. In the book Evangelism, we read, the dust and rubbish of error have buried the precious jewels of truth, but the Lord's workers can uncover these treasures so that many will look upon them with delight and awe. There is a great variety of work adapted to different minds and varied capabilities. We have to uncover the truth. The only way to uncover the truth, if it's buried in rubbish, is to take a shovel and get rid of the rubbish. How do you do that? By exposing it, saying, well, here's a pile of rubbish. This is not truth. And say why it is not truth and throw it out until you get to unadulterated truth. Well, what about perverted truth? Can you get perverted truth? Of course you can get perverted truth. Daniel 8 verse 12 says, And a host was given him against the daily, sacrifice is added, by reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced, and it prospered. So, error will prosper, because human nature just loves error. It is only truth that will set you free. And error prospers, unfortunately. To what extent? Second selected messages, every phase of fanaticism and erroneous theories claiming to be truth will be brought in amongst the remnant people of God. These will fill minds with erroneous sentiments which have no part in the truth for this time. Remember that truth for this time never negates truth that has already been established because you can only build truth upon truth. Any man who supposes that in the strength of his own devised resolutions 
In his intellectual might united with science or supposed knowledge, he can start a work which will conquer the world, will find himself lying amongst the ruins of his own speculations, and will plainly understand why he's there. And if we look at those mega churches that were constructed, that are now lying in ruins somewhere, with people having neglected one portion of the truth, or two portions, or all of it, well, they will have to discover why they're lying there. Psalms 119, verse 160 says, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endures forever. We have colleges that uh, seem to think teaching evolution is just okay. We have every wind of doctrine that negates the beginning of the word and <laughs> neglects the end as well, saying that that is 19th century philosophy. And the law is still in effect. Among the more serious of the evils that had developed among the Corinthian believers was that of a return to many of the debasing customs of heathenism. This church had been cleansed from all of this stuff, bringing in all this paraphernalia and this bedlam of noise in order to entertain minds. One former convert had so far backslidden that his licentious course was a violation of even the low standard of morality held by the Gentile world. The apostle pleaded with the church to put away from amongst them the wicked person. Know ye not, he admonished, that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. Now if it happened then already, it's not going to happen to us. Of course it's going to happen to us. Another grave evil that had arisen in the church was that of brethren going to law one with another. I mean, where do we come from when we take each other to court? Abundant provision had been made for the settlement of difficulties amongst believers. Christ himself had given plain instructions as how such matters were to be adjusted. If thy brother shall trespass against thee, the Savior had counseled, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone, and if he shall hear, that thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then, well, take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church, and if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee, as a heathen man and a publican. That means he becomes a mission object. <laughs> That's it. You don't hate him. You don't want to wipe him off the face of the earth. But it means you pray for that person. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now these issues can become very complicated. But we have certain guidelines, and we must stick to them. So, bringing the world into the church. I mean, if we look at what's happening in the world, this is such a ridiculous example. But this is how far you can go. You can bring in, like uh, Grace Cathedral, a very scantily clad lady singing with great pomp, in the churches and revolving their church services around such issues and call this the working of the Holy Spirit, it's nothing other than old pagan goddess worship. And uh, in a lesser way, some churches think that that's fine to bring it even into God's church today. But it's nothing other than heathenism creeping into the church. Nothing other. And what about uh, worldly activities, taking the mind off present truth? Some of our people are sports crazy. I used to be sports crazy. If my team lost in the past, I would be inclined to demolish the television set that told me so. 
I mean, how ridiculous can you get? And it's all a question of putting a ball in a net. And one year the one puts the ball in the next and the next one the other. It's ridiculous. And we have so many worldly things that we talk about and we don't even see because our minds are so occupied with that stupid box that we don't even see what's happening in terms of present truth. And isn't it interesting? I'm not going to talk about these things. But that uh, Donald Trump and Putin and the Pope all get presented by the Croatian president with a T-shirt with a number nine on it. Turn it round. And the other one can't get it because you only need three nines or three upside down nines if you want. The other one gets a 10. I mean, the symbolisms are all there. And who, who excites the world to bring in all of this stuff? Well, the Catholic Church boasts. Here's the Catholic Herald. The Catholic visionary who founded the World Cup. And the victory symbol was basically the goddess. Do we want to become like the world? Or do we have to separate ourselves from the world? Do we want to bring the world into the church and pretend that we have a new way to entertain minds? And then we wonder why one school after another is closing, why our universities have to solicit help from outside, why we have to go into partnerships with Babylon in order to remain functional. Isn't there a deeper problem? Is it just a sign of the times? Never, never was there a time when the truth suffered more from being misrepresented, belittled, demerited through the perverse disputings of men than in these last days. That's present truth. Men have brought themselves in with the heterogeneous mass of heresies which they represent as oracles for the people. The people are charmed with some strange new thing and are not wise in experience to discern the character of the ideas that men may frame up as something. But to call it something of great consequence and tied to the oracles of God does not make it truth. We cannot practice stupidity such as spiritual formation or emerging church methodologies or whatever they like to call it and pretend that we call it truth. When we're preaching universalism, everybody is saved. What's the point of the law? You might as well throw away half the Bible. Is there no retributive action? Is there not a judgment coming? Is there not a decision that has to be made? Where do we come across such ideologies? They're certainly not in harmony with the word and with what the spirit of prophecy teaches. Oh, how this rebukes the low standard of piety in the churches. Second Celeste Messages. Many who want to present something original will conjure up things new and strange and without consideration will step forward on these unstable theories that have been woven together as a precious theory and presented as a life and death question. And we argue about this issue and that issue when the important truths lie scattered on the wayside. Protest against removing these landmarks. When men come in, with, in who would move one pillar or pin from the foundation which God has established by the Holy Spirit, let the aged men who were pioneers in our work speak plainly. And let those who are dead speak also by the reprinting of their articles and in our periodicals. If I want to study an issue and I take our commentaries and I look at them and I go through them, there's lots of good information in them. Yes, they're very useful. They're all over my shelf and I use them. But sometimes they say just nothing. And you're left after reading it just as empty as when you started. It doesn't tell you anything. Not on everything, but on many things. 
I'm doing a, a study now on the, on the book of Zechariah. And if I read the commentary, well, I might just as well read something else. There's, there's nothing there. So how do I know? Is there any light on this? Then you go and study what the pioneers said about these things. And suddenly a light goes up and you say, good grief, why is this not in, the, in our commentaries? This is amazing. How they thought. We must bring them back to life. We must bring them back. Gather up the rays of divine light that God has given as he has led his people on step by step in the way of truth. The truth will stand the test of time and trial. We need to study. We need to study again. We need to study why we even exist. What is the reason why there is even a church that preaches the three angels' messages? Martin Luther summed it up well when he commented on the church's habit of accommodating preachers that love smooth messages or that will have you sit and meditate or breathe deeply. Good grief, if you want oxygen, go outside and breathe. Bad preachers have this luck that one bears and tolerates their folly. <laughs> I like Martin Luther. Even if one understands and feels that they are fools, even more so, one credits it to them for good. The true preacher, however, can do nothing right. Rather, one scrutinizes all their words and works to see if one can trip them up and if one can find a splinter, it is magnified to a vain log. There's no tolerance, only vain judgment, damnation, and scorn. He's right. Therefore, it is a miserable office to be a preacher. And it is impossible to persevere in it if one does not perceive it to be the honor of God and the to the benefit of one's neighbor. He must work and others must have the benefit and the honor. He, however, must bear loss and mocking as his reward. He has required love, but not enjoyment without permitting it to create depression. God's spirit must accomplish this flesh and blood or incapable of achieving it. I know exactly what he's talking about. Exactly. 31 years. I've been preaching this message. I can't believe it. 31 years. Feels like yesterday. And somehow the message is still going. As the end approaches, the testimonies of God's servants will become more decided and more powerful. Flashing the light of truth upon the system of error and oppression that have so long held the supremacy. The Lord has sent us messages for this time to establish Christianity upon an eternal basis and all who believe present truth must stand not in their own wisdom but in God and raise up the foundations of many generations. If we do not study what God has given this church, then how can we stand? If we're going to build on all that sand... These will be registered in the books of heaven as repairers of the breach and restorers of paths to dwell in. We are to maintain the truth because it is truth. In the face of the bitterest opposition, God is at work upon human minds. It is not man alone that is working. The great illuminating power is from Christ. The brightness of his example is to be kept before the people in every discourse. We have a present truth. We need to preach it. We are not to spend our time in controversy with those who know the truth and upon whom light of truth has been shining when they turn away their ears from the truth to turn to fables. And that's a very important point. I could spend all my time just talking about all of these silly ideologies that come into the church. I don't have time for it. There's a point where you have to do that, yes, but if they don't want to hear, let them do what they want to do. It's their problem. I was told that men will employ every policy to make less prominent the difference between the faith of Seventh-day Adventists and those who observe the first day of the week. I observe that everywhere. 
In this controversy, the whole world will be engaged, and the time is short. This is no time to haul down our colors. A company was presented before me under the name of Seventh-day Adventists who were advising that the banner or sign which makes us a distinctive people should not be held out so strikingly. For they claimed that it was not the best policy in securing success to our institutions. I saw some reaching out their hands to remove the banner and obscure its significance. I see them all the time. I'm actually astounded that I sometimes get invited to the very institutions that tear down the banner. Not by the institution, but by the students of that institution or something else. And there's always a huge furor as a result. And some of our magazines just love to distort it and write about it. And uh, you know what? Leave them. Because the truth will be made prominent even by the contempt placed upon it. Now, very often it has happened to me that I come to a place and the rectorate of some college or other has banned the meeting and forbidden all the students to come. What an excellent advertisement! The place is always packed. Yet the Lord did all he could to lead Israel back to allegiance to him. Through long dark years when ruler after ruler stood up in bold defiance of heaven, God sent message after message to his backslidden people. Through his prophets, he gave them every opportunity to return. Elijah and Elisha were to live and labor, and the tender appeals of Hosea, Amos, Abadiah, were to be heard in the land. Never was the kingdom of Israel left without noble witnesses to the mighty power of God to save from sin. Through these faithful ones, the eternal purpose of Jehovah was finally to be fulfilled. Just keep on preaching. Don't worry about it. There will be people that will listen. And eventually, they will become disenfranchised. Do you know how many people have left this church? And they don't come to church anymore. They sit out there. But they haven't really left. They're watching. And they're listening. What are they watching? What are they listening to? God will call his people back. And many that we consider backslidden are just people that have despaired. But they will come back. Because truth will pull them back. There's no other way. Brethren and sisters, I beg of everyone to make the most of this camp meeting. If you have backslidden, I entreat you for Christ's sake to return. Be converted. Reconverted. Let the conversions begin today. Let parents confess to their children in regard to the point on which they have neglected their duty. Don't be concerned about everything that happens in the church. Focus on the truth. And come back. Come back. How's the voice of truth going to increase if we all hide? If we go and sit in our separate little kingdom because it's become too uncomfortable? Just before the firstborn were slain in Egypt, the Lord instructed the Israelites to gather their children into their houses with them, to strike the lintel and the two side posts of the doors with blood, so that when the destroying angel went through the land, he would recognize the houses, thus marked as the dwelling places of Christ's followers. Today, we must gather our children about us if we desire to save them from the destructive power of the evil one. The conflict between Christ and Satan will increase in intensity until the end of the earth's history. We are to have faith in the blood of Christ in order that we may pass safely through the perilous times that are before us. I believe God is calling back his people. He wants them to come. So, how do I keep people in the church? How do I keep them on fire? You must evangelize. That's what you must do. You must reach out to reach in. If your message is not reaching out, it will fail To reach in. You must seek vertical growth. Kingdom growth. 
In other words, your growth must be aligned to the truth which is given from above. You don't want lateral growth. You don't want to draw from every church your people into a mega church and entertain them with a bedlam of noise and a light show. No, you don't want lateral growth. You want kingdom growth. People that are added to the kingdom of God because they take their stand on truth. That's what you want, kingdom growth, not lateral growth. And when you preach, preach as though the whole church is full of non-Adventists. You know, we're so scared of that name. I've never been ashamed of that name. In the beginning, yes. What are you? I don't know anything. What are you? I don't know anything. No. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. That name is a rebuke to the world. Why are you called Seventh-day Adventist? Well, I keep the seventh day. Why? Do you have a day and we have a day? No, I keep God's day. You keep your day. It says so here in the Bible. An Adventist, the blessed hope of the church, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Then preach and combine the aspects of truth. Lift up Christ in the context of the great controversy. Contrasting truth and error is a powerful tool. People don't like that. They say, why don't you only preach Jesus? Why don't you just preach Jesus? Why do you do this? Why are you constantly exposing this error? Well, the rubbish is lying on the truth. You can't see it. Get rid of the rubbish. Jesus used it all the time. He preached contrast. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. Contrast. Contrast. And they were saying, huh, huh, huh? How are we going to be better than they? Those, are, those people are wonderful. No. We'll have to talk about that one too. So preach truth. Do not be afraid to expose error. We cannot preach come out of my people without explaining what it is that the people have to come out of. How do you say, come out of Babylon? Hello. Who's Babylon? This is not unkind. This is love. This is service. The same happened to me when I was trapped in this era and somebody said, come out of Babylon. He first had to tell me what Babylon was before I realized, oops, I'm in it. I have to come out. The Lord has pronounced a curse upon those who take from or add to the scripture. The great I am has decided what shall constitute the rule of faith and doctrine. And he has designed that the Bible shall be the household book. The church that holds to the word of God is irreconcilably separated from Rome. Hmm. That's pretty straight. Hmm. Signs of the times. Protestants were once thus apart from this great church of apostasy, but they have approached more nearly to her and are still in the path of reconciliation to the church of Rome. Rome never changes. Her principles have not altered in the least. And we did a whole series in this very theater, Darkness Before Dawn, where we looked at the principles of Rome and we looked at the principles of Protestantism and we looked at their joint statements on justification and on reunification of the churches and we saw that every single principle of Protestantism had been discarded and that were back in the folds of Rome. Are we going to be part of that? No. The church that holds to the word of God is irreconcilably separated from Rome. There is no way that we can go that Rome. It never changes. Her principles have not altered in the least. She has not lessened the breach between herself and Protestants. They have done all the advancing. But what does this argue for the Protestantism of this day? It is the rejection of Bible truth which makes men approach to infidelity. It is a backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. Those are straight words. You preach that today, you're not very welcome. But is it welcome that we want? Or do we want to follow the marching orders of a higher source? This is the webpage of Amazing Discoveries. It's just so 
stunning to me. When there are so many places that say, you're not allowed to preach this message. This message is not welcome. Stay away. Or, or attempts to shut down the message or to lessen the message or whatever. This is fascinating stuff. Amazing Discoveries has been around for some 25 years, I think it is. And I want you to look at the number of viewers just on the Amazing Discoveries YouTube site. Just that one. That excludes the satellite television and all of those things. Look at the number of viewers. 14,350,197. 14 million people are watching these messages. That's just this official website. Now there are people that make money by showing things that are popular to the world or to the people out there in the world on their web pages. They monetize. And some of those web pages that have taken this information illegally have even more views than this. So how many millions of people are actually watching? It's just incredible. I get information from sources that soldiers that were in Iraq were watching. Police forces in the world, I'm not going to mention where from, phone, and the whole police force is watching. Government officials watching. In Germany, the government confiscated my whole series because there was a complaint. And for a year, they had to study them to release me from the complaint. <laughs> God has amazing ways of making people aware of the message. Now, how many people are sitting in this audience? You can look around. It's not a, it's not a great number. It doesn't matter. The church might look and say, hmm, a bunch of rebels sitting there together. No, no, no. Eventually, 14 million jump into the other web pages. Maybe 100 million people are watching. And we don't know how it happens. I cannot do it. I don't even know how it happened. And this is just one media form. This is just one. This is just you, you. It excludes all the others. And what are they watching? And why are they watching? Well, let's have a look at this. Watch time. And you can see that it's remained constant. And here are the minutes of watch time. 39,729,237 minutes of watch time. Do you know how many hours that is that people sit and watch this stuff? So this is not just a click and then away. The statistics are not provided by me or by any one of, of us. It's provided by YouTube. That's how many hours people sit and watch. How many people are viewing? 1,911,000 just from this year are constantly watching. And you don't know, is that one individual? Is it two? sitting together and watching it? Is it perhaps a whole church sitting and watching it and streaming it? You don't know the number. It's millions that are watching. This message will not keep the young people in the church. I hear this all the time. Yes, we have these mega churches and then they're gone. Then we've lost all the young people. Let's have a look at these statistics. This is unbelievable. Here, what are the age groups? Look at the numbers here. Watch time, 10 million and 90. These are just these videos. This is just the total onslaught series. Just that series, not any of the others. Let's look at the statistics. Age group that is watching. Here is up to 24. And here's the age group, 25 to 34 years old. Look at that. Isn't this the youth? Isn't this the people that have influence? 
Aren't these the parents that have little children and make up the church? So you have very young people. Then you have the largest group is the 25 to 34 years old. Up to 44 years, not far behind. Then you get 54 years, and then you get the older people. There is a, a graph which says that the young people are listening to messages because they feel they're getting something. Is this a way to keep the church? Preach the truth in its unadulterated form and you will have listeners. Here is the Rekindling the Reformation series. Now this really surprises me. Rekindling the Reformation series and the largest group watching is the youth up to 24 years old. Isn't that incredible? Rekindling the Reformation, and they're looking at all of these slides and all of the issues of the Reformation and what happened there. Not drums, no drums, no light show, none of, the, none of that. This is just one series, and the youngest group is the greatest group of them all. Young and old and everything in between. This is not boasting. This is just a statistic. It surprised me probably more than it surprises you. Millions and millions of people want to hear truth. The Christian mission in the world is to reveal the character of Christ, to present the Lord to the fallen children of men. And if it's done by contrast, then Christ becomes more prominent. Why do Catholics make such good Adventists? Because of the contrast. You suddenly realize, but excuse me, the church teaches this, but the Bible teaches this. Church teaches this, the Bible teaches this. Church teaches this, Bible teaches this. Contrast. It makes the truth prominent. Justification, atonement, and salvation. We need to know how are you saved? How are you justified? Rome says you're justified by your works. And you receive grace via the system, via the Pope. The Bible says no. You're justified by the imputed righteousness of Christ. The atonement. Rome says there is no atonement. Jesus didn't die for you. Islam teaches there is no atonement. Jesus didn't die for you. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Contrast. Something wrong here. How am I saved? There's no other way under heaven and earth whereby you can be saved except by Christ Jesus. Contrast. Look at it. And then people will understand. But the ways that the world is teaching is not in harmony with Scripture. They will say to you, you're a legalist because you're preaching the law. All of these things will be thrown at you. Well, my answer to that would be, how can rest and work be one and the same thing? Keeping the Sabbath. Isn't the Sabbath rest? So how can keeping the Sabbath be works? Can't be works, it's rest. Resting in what? In the completed works of God. So it is appropriating that rest which can only come from God. His righteousness being imputed and imparted and resting in the completed work that he has performed and is performing in me. And you. I see so much given to those who already have. These wonderful meetings for those who wish to get more strength are depriving the world of the very work that should be done. Our ministers should now be working for the saving of the lost. The weeks spent in gathering to fit men for work might better, far better be spent in going to the highways and hedges with the proclamation, come for all things are now ready. We have so many meetings on all sides, on the liberal side, 
teaching you methodologies of being in communion with God on the one hand. And on the other hand, we have this drive to tell you how to become perfect so that you can stand. It's all about I, I, I. No, go preach to the world. Go and preach to the outside. Get your fingers burnt. And watch the miracles that happens when you do this. It's astounding to see how God moves obstacles that you believe would never be possible to be removed. I mean, if I take my own life, how is it possible that I end up preaching in the most impossible places? Who opened that door? Certainly not me. I can't open those doors. To those who obey the light they have, illumination will come from on high, for the heavenly messengers are waiting to cooperate with men in warning a deceived sinful world. This hovering about the churches to keep them propped up makes them more dependent on human effort. Bleat, bleat of the sheep. All we do is run off the sheep. They learn to lean on the experience of their fellow men and do not make God their dependence and their efficiency. The time you devote to imparting constantly to those who understand the message of warning will not give one tithe of the strength which they would receive in taking hold of the work to communicate life to saving, perishing souls. We are not to hover over the 99, but to go and seek the lost. This is our counsel. And we're not doing it. That's why we have all of these light show churches. And, and what are they bringing? Hovering over the 99. Bleat, 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 bleat. What's the point? Our message is exclusive. It is a message of separation from the world. The modern way is no, 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 no. You mustn't do that. Everybody is part of the circle of the family. It doesn't matter what denomination or religion they believe, belong to. All you do is you preach Jesus. And when they say, well, Jesus is wonderful, then you've done your job. That's it. And uh, by the way, if you, if you attend a certain religious ceremony uh, in your particular religious field, well, that's just your culture. No, come out, be separate. I was a Roman Catholic. I had to come out. I had to leave the cathedral. I had to leave the mass. I had to throw it away. It wasn't biblical. But I was also German. Which means I had to leave my ice pine. I could still eat the sauerkraut, but I had to leave the beer too. There are certain cultural aspects which you have to leave behind when you make this change. It just so happens. Ruth said to Naomi, where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. There are changes that must take place. That's not popular in this world. Numbers 23 verse 5, and the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return unto Balak, and thus thou shalt speak. And he returned unto him, and lo, he stood by the burnt sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab, and he took up this parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east. Interesting, east. Mysticism. Saying, Come, curse me, Jacob. Come and defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? How shall I defy whom the Lord has not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned amongst the nations. It's a condition. Come out and be separate. Do not be part of the nations. I still have German tendencies and have to work against them furiously every day. And I have people who remind me of my German tendencies to make sure I don't forget. Does that mean I despise them? No. No. Come out. They must be saved. 
They must become part of the family of God. And if you are in a church that does all of these strange things, well, find one that doesn't. And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, and the singers, Nehemiah 10, 28, and the Nethanims, these are all the ones that God is praising, and all they had, what? Separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of God. What had they separated themselves from? From the peoples of the land unto what? Unto the government of God. And God has a law. They came and they consecrated themselves unto the law of God. Their wives, their sons, their daughters, everyone having knowledge and having understanding. If you start understanding the plan of salvation, you will separate. And you will do what you're supposed to do. Psalms 135 verse 4, And the Lord has chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his peculiar treasure. Exodus 19.5, Now therefore if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And the same we read in Deuteronomy, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord has chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. Yes, this church is in turmoil, but it has the truth. And we must separate ourselves unto the truth. And we find the truth clearly delineated for us and demarcated, and we have to stick to it. Seventh-day Adventists have been chosen by God as a peculiar people, separate from the world. It's a condition. By the great cleaver of truth, he has cut them out from the quarry of the world and brought them into connection with himself. He has made them his representatives and he has called them to be ambassadors for him in the last work of salvation. The greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals, the most solemn and fearful warnings ever sent by God to man have been committed to them to be given to the world and in the accomplishment of this work, our publishing houses are among the most effective agencies. And you know what? The electronic media that we are using today is nothing other than a publishing house. It publishes information. That's what it does. And why was it necessary to have even independent ministries? And let's face it, many independent ministries are a pain in the neck. They are. They've severed themselves from the church. They sit on their holy hill saying, we have become holy, you are apostate. Hmm. No. We're one family. Cannot separate yourself. Then why is it necessary? When I became a member of this church, there were no independent ministries. 31 years ago, the only independent ministries that existed on the face of the earth were health institutes. There was no institute that needed to preach the three angels' message. It wasn't necessary. Why not? Because the church was doing it. And as the church stopped doing it, what did God do? He had to raise up independent ministries. And does it have an effect? Well, you saw the statistics. Yes, it does. But we cannot separate ourselves from the body. We cannot. If we don't work in harmony with the body, then we are a severed member, a severed arm. Our arm is useless. It's useless. A leg by itself is useless. You have to stay within the system. You have to cooperate with it. We have a Seventh-day Adventist message. Any institution that calls itself by that name and doesn't preach this message has a problem. At this time, when we are so near the end, shall we become so like the world in practice that men may look in vain to find God's denominated people? Shall any man sell our peculiar characteristics as God's chosen people for any advantage the world has to give? 
Shall the favor of those who transgress the law of God be looked upon as of great value? We invite them all the time to our institutions. I don't understand why. Shall those whom the Lord has named his people suppose that there is any power higher than the great I am? Shall we endeavor to blot out the distinguishing points of faith that have made us Seventh-day Adventists? Nobody can get baptized into an independent ministry unless it's become so apostate that it thinks itself the bee's knees. You become part of the church. You have to be linked with the church. Sometimes the church doesn't like it, but it certainly cannot ignore it with those millions and millions of viewers. And it should begin to ask itself the question, why are the millions of viewers looking at that? Shouldn't we return to that and start preaching it in the church that we don't need independent ministries anymore? Shouldn't the church wake up? So, summary and admonition. I would say reach out and you will not fail of reaching in. And you can only reach out if you preach contrasting truth with error. Preach as though your church is packed with non-SDAs. Make every sermon an outreach. Stand astounded as God honors your commitment and strangers sit in your pews. In my country, when the church reigned, the Protestant church reigned, Seventh-day Adventists were even barred from being buried in normal cemetery, cemeteries. They had to be buried with the criminals. Yeah. In some towns, if an Adventist died, he couldn't get the undertaker of the town to take care of the one who had died, you'd have to solicit someone from another town or another city because you were barred from dealing with this apostate. People never came to our churches. Today I stand astounded. We used to always rent halls and do things like that. Today I preach in a church that's packed with non-Adventists. Often half of the audience is non-Adventists. Why? Why? Why would they come? Because they're so unhappy with what is happening in their own systems. And they're watching on YouTube and they're watching here and they see, oh, okay, let's go. And that's the way it should be. Preach to non-Adventists. However, prepare your people for the fire of new members. As when those prodigals return, well, uh, they shake the comfort zones of those who are sitting in there. Because... When they come, they've listened to the health message. And they come to the potluck and they say, excuse me, what's all this garbage on this table? And the members become offended. <laughs> These outside people know more than they do. There is a massive church out there that belongs to this church without even knowing it. Teach the members to be sensitive to the feelings and even the misconceptions of strangers. Truth is progressive. It must be allowed to grow at its own pace. Let the word do the cutting. They will have questions, many, many questions. Take the word, answer them. Solomon had all the wisdom at his disposal. So do we. Because the source of wisdom is God and he's given us volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of knowledge to answer all the questions, every single one that people have on a spiritual level. Use the talents of the members. You must have total membership involvement. There's no room for spectators in this work. Everybody has been called. A mega church cannot operate. It's an entertainment center. If you belong to a mega church, then split it up into groups of 50s with captains of 50s and give them marching orders. Engage the whole church in Bible studies, hospitality, and the right arm of the gospel. This is how you grow a church. Do not neglect the right arm of the gospel. Clear minds lead to clear understanding and discernment. How do you think you can understand if your brain is so clogged with all the stuff that is on the table that you cannot even discern right from wrong, let alone stay awake? 
Do not stress about numbers. The gospel is like yeast that leavens the lump. We are sowers. God makes the seed grow and ripen. You don't have to be concerned whether there are two people in your audience or 10 or 50 or 1,000 or 5,000. It makes no difference. If you think how those great preachers used to come into the church, the Wesleys and all of those people, sometimes they were the only ones who sat in a pew and the preacher thought, I must give up preaching, and he decided to preach to this one person and a great movement started. Don't underestimate God. If God wants millions of people in his church, he calls 12. If you think you need a mega church in order to impress God, think again. Isaiah 35 verse 2. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Preach truth, and this will be fulfilled to the letter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have entrusted this church with so much knowledge. You have given us clear directions, clear prophecies as to exactly what will transpire. And what is the point if we don't share it? Help us to share it and make this church what this verse, Isaiah 35 verse 2, promises that it should be. In Jesus' name, amen. YouTube. I'm Walter Feit from Amazing Discoveries. If you'd like to learn more or you would like to subscribe, then click visit our webpage, donate, share, and we would like to hear from you.